million years ago, Italy was a battlefield, where enormous violent volcanoes offered competing displays of bursts of fire, lava flows, clouds of hot ash, and showers of lapilli. They raised mountains and erased valleys. It was a mineral world. There was no room for plants or animals. Then, a hundred thousand years ago, one by one, the volcanoes stopped erupting. Rain gradually filled the ancient craters, turning them into lakes. It was the beginning of a new adventure for life, which this time conquered the land of volcanoes. These pines, whipped by the storm, are all less than 50 years old. They cannot be a day older, because 50 years ago, the temperature of the rocks here exceeded 1,000 degrees, and everything burned within a radius of hundreds of meters. These black rocks that had just erupted from the crater of Mount Etna were fluid and incandescent. No form of life could withstand the terrible heat that had sprung from the womb of the earth through the highest active volcano in Europe. that gave rise to these trees arrived soon afterwards, when the lava had cooled. These pines have brought with them a small bird, the red crossbill, which feeds on pine nuts. Etna's crossbills are quite different from those that live in the rest of Europe, and are likely to belong to an exclusive local subspecies. These pines, however, cannot expect to survive for long, because for 200,000 years, Etna has never stopped determining the fate of plants, animals and humans. After the eruption, there is no peace, only a truce. Sometimes short, sometimes longer. Etna threatens not only shrubs and woods, but also crops, homes and an entire city. Catania, one of the most heavily populated in Sicily and the Mediterranean. Here, people live permanently in its grip, because Etna is still one of the most formidable volcanoes in the world. This volcano was well known to the ancients. It was visible from far off for those coming from the sea between Sicily and Greece. The Arabs, who for a long time dominated this island, the largest in the Mediterranean and among the most fertile and rich, called it Yebel, the mountain, from which it derives its second name, Mongibello. Etna is a unique world, 
not only for volcanologists, but also for naturalists. This mountain rises from the plain of the river Simeto, where every summer temperatures reach over 40 degrees and is covered with snow and ice on its summit. In these 3,300 meters of difference in height, the environment changes continuously, from the highly cultivated lower slopes to the increasingly wild terrain. In higher up, until the point where people have had to give up entirely. Here, it is the volcano that rules. Plants and animals know it, but that doesn't mean they give up trying to challenge it. The environments of Etna can be represented as a series of concentric circles, depending on the altitude and age of the lava and ash deposits. The central circle, the smallest, corresponds to the top of the volcano. Here, the lava is recent and is continually renewed by new flows. There is snow for six months of the year, and often the temperature drops below zero. But as soon as the white blanket withdraws, life timidly returns. Some boulders, true volcanic bombs, weigh tons and were launched hundreds of meters high during the most violent eruptions when the pressure of the underground gas reached unsustainable levels. Now, they lie inert, but their impact on the ground has been as violent as that of an explosion. Only a few specialized plants and heroic creatures manage to live in this environment that resembles the earth at the dawn of life. Oedipa grasshoppers are the color of the lava. They can survive up to an altitude of 3,000 meters and are only active for three months of the year. In this period, males and females have to find each other caught and then lay their eggs, hoping that small birds like the resident black redstart don't spot them. It is usually the males that produce the shrill sound by rubbing one tegman against the other. Crickets sing to mark their territory, ward off other males or to attract females. The lava is shattered into small stones, a difficult terrain for plant life, in which the plants have little time to put the roots. Some boulders are encrusted with lichens. They are the result of the symbiosis between a mushroom and an algae. The former ensures the logistics, the adherence to the substrata and the ability to withstand the elements while the second guarantees a continuous supply of sugars through photosynthesis. The result is excellent. The mushroom algae pear is the first to settle on the lava. The higher plants arrive later, and in order to survive, they have to cling to the ground to resist the impact of the wind that blows ceaselessly. Their leaves are covered with hairs to trap droplets of water carried by the fog, which is a friend of life. The fog is the main source of water for high altitude plants. Because the soil does not retain water, which immediately flows away underground. 
Each larva expanse has a well-defined age. Its date of birth corresponds to the eruption that brought magma to the surface. One, two, ten, twenty years are the intervals of time that the volcano makes available for life to be born, get organised and prepare to die. Yet, in this short span of time, plants give life to a structured community, with cushions of astralagus growing by creeping along the ground thickly, creating in their central section a moist microcosm protected from the wind that is the heart of the plant. The astralagus cushion acts as a cradle a nursery for more delicate plants, the beginnings of a more complex vegetation that begins to take hold where the lava is older and a small valley or depression softens the strength of the storms. It is not uncommon for insects and spiders to land here, caught up in the wind at lower altitudes and transported high up by the drafts that blow up the slopes of the volcano. Many are destined to die because of the low night temperatures or lack of food, but some manage to survive and find a personal refuge. Plants, often thorny and toxic, provide some food, and this is where the first signs of the presence of an animal of some size can be found. A hare has left its unmistakable excrement. But when night falls, it ventures out into the open. In the remaining hours of daylight, it rests in the thick of an impenetrable shrub to hide from its most feared enemies, foxes and golden eagle. There is only one pair of golden eagles on Etna. The lack of prey and of suitable places to build nests makes it impossible for a second pair to settle. This female is the undisputed queen of the expanses of lava and shrubs that it flies over in the hope that some hare has decided to come out into the open before it gets dark. Broom brushes push their roots into the expanse of sand and ash. They are plants exclusive to Etna and have an exceptional resistance. Insects and small vertebrates shelter among their stems. Lower down, the second ring in the succession of Etna environments corresponds to the woods, made up of broad-leaved trees and conifers Sometimes they catch fire because of the incandescent lava that grazes them or streaks them like a black scar. But when they do manage to survive, they shelter a rich fauna. These pines are the result of artificial reforestation, but now appear very natural. Some are monumental plants, Others are just beginning to grow in the cracks where the wind has deposited a bit of hummus and a pine nut was lucky enough to fall. Birches alternate with pine woods, a surprisingly boreal-like vegetation that has found the right growing conditions in the heart of the Mediterranean, as if it were in Lapland or Siberia. 
They are elegant plants with a white trunk that contrasts sharply with the black lava. This lava cordon is the result of an eruption 20 years ago and the birch forest has had time to develop. The soil here is very fertile and even though water is scarce, the plants have found a way to push their roots deep into the soil. Etna is part of a regional park dedicated to the conservation of the rich biodiversity that in the rest of Sicily has been considerably reduced by a long process of colonization. Here, on the other hand, the volcano's intemperate behavior has prevented humans from acting too arrogantly and has allowed many interesting life forms to survive, representing a cold, humid, biological refuge in the heart of one of the hottest parts of the entire European continent. At lower altitudes than the birches, an extensive and intact wood of oaks and other deciduous trees makes its way through the lava. The boulders and the trunks are covered with moss, which acts like a sponge, preserving the water even in times of drought. A fox slinks furtively through the undergrowth. It is the island's largest terrestrial predator since wolves were wiped out at the beginning of the 20th century. Its diet includes fruit, berries, rodents, reptiles and, if desired, something more substantial. It could attempt to take one of a litter of wild boars, but they are jealously guarded by the sows. The wild boar is the most widespread ungulate on the island, and the only one that is truly indigenous. Wild boar can count on acorns and chestnuts, and of course, on an infinite variety of animal and vegetable substances that its sensitive snout can detect in the undergrowth. Humans have opened clearings in the wood and profiting from the fertile volcanic soil have planted small orchards. In the distance, we can see the blue Ionian, the stretch of sea that separates, or rather unites, Sicily to the rest of the eastern Mediterranean. Thanks to the orchards, insects are widely present, and here come the most deadly predators of the wood, which have their nest in some old trunks of chestnut or oak. Hornets. They have no match. No other animal can fight with this creature, equipped with sharp jaws and a venomous sting that is used for hunting and defence. These cousins of the wasp are three times larger and ten times more dangerous. They cause the death of more people every year in Italy than all other wild creatures combined. Hornets really are super wasps. Although they also like to feed on sap and fruit, they are the deadliest enemies of all the insects in the woodland and in the clearings. As soon as they spot their prey, they seize upon it and strike it with their stingers loaded with venom 
and start to tear it apart with the same voracity with which a lion dismembers a buffalo. They are capable of slicing up any prey with their mandibles, which are as sharp as shears. Then the victim, reduced to a small mass, is carried to the nest. Even wasps are not spared. A hornet colony can kill thousands of insects, bringing fresh meat to the nest without rest. The only species which is carefully avoided by the hornets and all other kinds of predators is this tiny, slow moth whose striking coloration announces to all predators that they are toxic and inedible. They can indulge in long courtship and mating rituals without fear of being killed by anything. The hornet's nest is hidden deep in the trunk of a tree and is virtually impregnable. The combs are made of paper obtained by the soft wood of some trees. They chew the branches to obtain a pulp of cellulosa mixed with saliva, a wonderful papier-mâché ready to form the hexagonal cells of the growing colonial nest. It is a rather complex building, well hidden in the hole of a large trunk. It is ruled by the queen, the only fertile female which lays her eggs, and it is the headquarters of a community that has grown to several hundred workers. A guard always protects the entrance to an impregnable nest that no animal would ever dream of attacking, at least not without adequate protection. Even the most terrible of the super predators will eventually come across something more powerful than itself. In fact, there is one animal that has the tools and the skills to deal with these super wasps. The honey buzzard. The body of this large bird of prey is covered with a thick plumage that is elastic and resistant to stings. Only the eyes are vulnerable to attack by hornets and wasps, but the buzzard has once more brought a honeycomb full of lava to the nest to feed her chicks. It is a diffident, distrustful raptor, always looking around to make sure that there are no enemies in sight. Then. Once the meal is over, it sets off on a new hunting expedition. The Etna woods extend mainly on the northern side of the volcano, where rainfall is more abundant and the humidity is higher. Where they have been overexploited and cut down, they have been replaced by expanses of bush that in spring are covered with blooms. This is the start of the largest range of environments, the third ring that corresponds to the lowest altitudes, where people have had the time and the strength to cultivate the most ancient expanses of lava. It stretches for about 50 kilometres and covers the slopes of the large volcano close to the north by the valley dug out by the Anapo and to the south by the one marked by the course of the Simeto, both fed by snow and rain falling on Mount Etna. It rains very little at the base of the volcano 
just 300 millimetres a year, the same as in North Africa. The rains are concentrated in a four-month rainy season spanning autumn and winter. Otherwise, there is only a long dry season that lasts from April until October. This cycle affects the development of the vegetation and the natural history of all living creatures, plants and animals. Before the sun transforms the scrubland into a bleak expanse of withered plants, in a few tens of square metres of earth, dozens of species of plants with showy blooms can be spotted among the stones, rocks and clumps of prickly grasses. These are the perennials, those that never die, because they have tubers, bulbs and succulent roots to see them through the long summer break when all their external parts, leaves and stems, die. In the height of the summer season, with temperatures on the ground touching 50 degrees, most bushes start to lose their leaves. Blackberries attract many animals. Among the favourite exploiters, one of the largest European butterflies, the two-tailed pasha, as large as a passerine bird. Etna is a special place for many other species of butterflies, which gather on the flowers. The caterpillar of the peacock moth butterfly grows on wild blackberries and other wild rosacea. Like all caterpillars, it has three pairs of true legs at the front and four pairs of pro legs on the back of its body. Thanks to its healthy appetite, the larva reaches its full size in 40 days, multiplying its original weight by 10,000 and then it is ready to build its cocoon with silk threads. In the course of the millennia, the pressure of herbivores has led the plants to defend themselves with spines and toxic substances. Livestock, but also insects, avoid ferula, a large plant of the ombrellifera. This could be considered a symbol of Sicily's farmland, a huge herb with a wooden stem which is widely used to build structures and to provide fuel. Ferulas have flowers of exceptional value for insects because their leaves are avoided by livestock. Sheep, cattle and wild herbivores all keep away from the toxic milk of the euphorbia. Almost all insects do the same. The euphorbia hawk moth caterpillar is the only animal in Europe which is able to feed on the poisonous euphorbia leaves in order to transform into a beautiful olive and pink hawk moth. In the distance, the silhouette of the volcano, with its unmistakable plume of smoke, dominates one of the most desolate parts of the island. An area where population density is very low and agricultural activity is still carried out by traditional methods. Fruit plants Pistachios, citrus fruits alternate with expanses of wild scrub, where the lava has prevented even the cultivation of prickly pears, but has provided the basic material for every construction. Now, most of these stone walls are completely abandoned, 
It is a pity, but somebody chose to utilise them, because in the gentle rolling grassy landscape they are like the copiers of the Serengeti. The stones are covered with lichens and small fat plants, sedum, which bloom in the early spring, the short spring of Sicily, one of the driest places in the Mediterranean. Due to the high temperatures in the day, life takes place mainly at night. Bush crickets that during the day have remained sheltered from the leaves and thorns at night go out in search of food. Green bush crickets are able to feed on the hairy and poisonous caterpillar of the gypsy moth. Smaller species are skilled hunters and don't hesitate to stoop to cannibalism. They have to be careful though because this is also the hunting territory of the tarantulas. The spiders are very fast. They grab their prey with their legs and immediately inject a venom that paralyzes it. A female lovingly carries her cocoon containing hundreds of eggs. She is willing to sacrifice her life rather than give up her cumbersome and conspicuous burden. Then, at dawn, spiders and bush crickets withdraw while the sun begins to light up the countryside on the slopes of Etna. The Simeto Valley extends on the southern side of Etna, crossed by the most important river in Sicily, which flows towards Catania. The Simeto River is fed by melting snow and the rains of the volcano. One of its more spectacular spots is the bridge of the Saraceni, which dates back to the Roman Empire. The Saracen Bridge was rebuilt and modified in the 12th century in the Middle Ages by the Normans. The bridge crosses a stretch of lava gorges, a particular basaltic formation due to even more ancient flows from Etna. Here the river crosses an area of pastures and citrus groves and lingers to form pools of calm, deep water that are a great attraction for insects in the sunny countryside. Ants are active in the cooler hours, leaving the nest as soon as it gets light to search for food. Thanks to the omnivorous and scavenger species, the environment is cleaned of waste and dead bodies of all kinds. But many species are herbivorous, even granivorous, collecting the seeds of annual plants. Ants must fend themselves from the hot sun rays, hiding in the nest when the sun is high in the sky. But early in the morning they are active and they meet their most terrible enemy. Immobile during the cool, damp night, ant lions wait for the sun to warm them. 
they're not dragonflies. They belong to a very particular order, the Neuroptera. Their larvae have been working through the night, digging a series of small funnel-shaped holes in the sand. These are simple but effective traps, in the centre of which lurk the ant-lion larva, with their soft defenceless bodies and two enormous pincer-like jaws. It becomes not merely inconvenient, but also very risky for ants to move through this minefield. The ants try to circumvent the area of the funnels. Any ant that falls into the hole has little chance of avoiding the jets of sand and then the terrible jaws waiting to seize the prey and inject venomous saliva into its body. It is a tomb with no way out. This battle is repeated every day. The ants cannot avoid crossing the minefield and the ant lions are there to demand their tribute. One ant is stronger or luckier than the others. This brave, strong ant is safe and can resume its walk in search of seeds. The abundance of insects attracts many birds, such as bee-eaters, which, after spending the winter in Africa, south of the Sahara, arrive in Sicily in the spring. Bee-eaters nest in tunnels excavated in the soil, sometimes in vertical riverbanks, sometimes directly on the ground where the soil is softer. They eat insects of all kinds. It is enough to wait near their nests to see a veritable list of the insect life of the steppes. A cabbage white butterfly bee, painted lady. This, however, survived. It is a beautiful dragonfly. Bee eaters catch insects in mid-air, and they do not refrain from attacking even the most dangerous insect in these parts the hornet. They are able to kill them by beating them repeatedly on a branch until they are dead and harmless. Then they can be swallowed. All that remains of the insect's body is a pellet which is regurgitated from their stomach. The bee-eaters are summer guests on Etna, together with many other colourful migratory birds, like the sea jays. They also nest along the banks of the Simeto, drawn by this wonderful little river that flows through a sun-drenched land. The Alcantara is famous for its impressive gorges excavated in rather young basaltic rocks which date back some 8,000 years.
The basaltic lava, low in silica but rich in iron, magnesium and calcium, cooled very quickly due to the river water and has thus given rise to pentagonal and hexagonal prismatic forms which recall the molecular structure of the materials that make it up. The rock, deeply fractured, lines up in curious shapes that seem to be the work of a human hand, a pile of wood, a harp or a rosette. The most regular formations are the vertical ones, the organ pipes that can reach 30 metres in height. At their narrowest points the gorges are less than two metres wide and here the water flows tumultuously. Wood pigeons are widespread on the banks of the river. These large pigeons were once rather scarce in Sicily, but are now rapidly increasing, although they represent the favourite prey of a family of peregrine falcons, which has decided to nest among the steep slopes. The peregrine falcon is the fastest and most skilled of the winged hunters, but needs a lot of space for its aerial manoeuvres. The peregrine falcon chicks have now grown, and they have left their nest located in a cleft of the rocks overlooking the river. But they must be careful, they could fall. They rest on small ledges and try to maintain their balance while preening their feathers. If they fell, there would be no protection. The current would sweep them away. But the desire to get out of the narrow hole where they have lived for weeks is too strong. The day of their escape from the narrow river gorge has arrived. The river continues to flow towards the Sicilian coast, cutting increasingly deep into the basalt. The path of the water can be diverted, but it cannot be stopped and will always flow downhill that is sure. Equally certain is that the whole landscape on the slopes of Etna is destined to change, whether we like it or not. The lava has reached the coast of the sea and has given rise to an impressive cliff and a series of small islands that emerge from the blue waters. Etna has been here for about 200,000 years and in living memory erupts majestically at least once a year. It is a relatively young, vigorous volcano and in recent times vents have opened on the slopes at very low altitude and from here rivers of lava have flown down, wiping out everything they find in their way. Workers scramble to block the lava path with the most powerful bulldozers and even dynamite, trying to erect dams to stop and divert the rivers of lava and save homes. But woods, stretches of scrubland and crops have often disappeared within a matter of hours. It seems almost impossible that this landscape can be so radically transformed and sterilised within a few hours, but the volcano can do exactly that. If it decides to unleash the power rumbling in the belly of the earth, 
It does so in a few moments. With clouds of incandescent ash, showers of lapilli, and above all, flows of molten lava. It is a grandiose spectacle that attracts millions of tourists who reach the Sapienza refuge at a height of almost 2,000 meters, miraculously spared by the eruptions. From here, thanks to a cable car and special vehicles, you can almost reach the edge of the main crater, knowing, as the guides point out, that the volcano is unpredictable and can claim a human life at any moment if you are not prudent. The volcano has turned into a burning torch, and not until the following day, when the columns of smoke and steam have dispersed, will it be possible to understand the extent of the eruption and the damage. And to what extent and in what way life will have to recover what the volcano has destroyed in a single night.